This, this is the Impressions Exchange Podcast. Impressions Exchange Podcast. Where all topics impacting the graphic imaging and printing industry are addressed via in-depth news coverage, analysis, and timely interviews. Hi, I'm Denise Gustafson, Editorial Director for Printing United Alliance and the guest host for the special Printing Impressions Podcast series in celebration of Women's History Month, highlighting women in the printing industry. During this series, I'll have the opportunity to talk with women from all segments of the industry about their experiences and their journey as a woman in the industry. So today, it's my pleasure to welcome Stacey Daniels Beckman. She's a partner with Firebrand Printing. So Stacey, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. So to get us started, can you give me a little bit of background about Firebrand Printing? Firebrand's been around for all of four years now. We started in COVID, like all wise businesses. Of course. Of course. I had been with a label company for almost 20 years. They'd been acquired by one of the big players. And I think I was much more of a startup mentality from when it started. Didn't feel so much like such a quite the same good niche for us. My focus on wanting to be really good in one area was not being met. Two partners and I started it. It's owned by two women and a gay guy. We focus on an outdoor UL material that has twice the tested outdoor shelf life of the industry standard polyester. Very cool. So we do a lot of work in energy and medical and prototyping. Very interesting. A very unique niche that you guys have. It is a small niche. When printing went digital, I remember looking at my job at the time and thinking, everybody thinks they can do this. Mm -hmm. You can't, but it's going to take you all 20 years to figure that out. And I remember thinking everything needs a label. I really did think that everything needs a stinking label. It has to be waterproof, has to hold up to what you're putting it underneath. And it's going to take the rest of the world a little bit longer to figure that out with the digital toners, right? Yep. So I was very fortunate. I went in the label industry at a very, very good time in the 2003 when printing was changing a lot, but that one industry was still staying kind of constant. Mm -hmm. And so Firebrand now still stays. All we do is labeling primarily for things that want to label. It's going to last for 20 plus years. Very, very cool. So yes, I said very, very specific niche as well. So it is a specific niche because everybody and their brother, when you go online, says they can print everything in the world. Everybody can print four color process. Everybody can do domes. Everybody can do all sorts of things. And the reality is you probably can't or you're farming it out or you do half of that really, really well. Mm -hmm. We're pretty straight. I've had customers who followed me who've asked if we can do things for them. If I can't run it in house, probably not going to touch it unless there's some value that we add that you can't get. I've got a couple customers with 600 plus SKUs. And at this point, they just don't want to learn how to organize them. <laughs> so sure. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> I got you. No problem. Right. How did you get started in this crazy business? I did like print from day one. There are family stories of when I was very young, me being very entranced by my grandmother's collection of very old magazines from the early 1900s. And I look back at that, those printing process, and they were letterpress, and you could touch the deboss in the paper. Mm -hmm. I liked it. I liked the way ink smelled. I was good at drawing. I was good at art, air quotes, but I was never going to make a living off of it. I wanted to be the person who shared it. When I was very young, my mom took me to a, see a printing press in action. My uncles ran the Seattle Times. I think there were six of them at one point that worked for that newspaper. When they took me there, I wouldn't leave. I made them show me how to do a make ready. I made my uncle stop and take me to a different press because that one had CMYK on it. <laughs> I was fascinated by the size of the rolls. Mm -hmm. I was working at a small AB Dick shop when I was 17 as I doing the cutter. I went to a trade school for printing. I just liked it. I just thought it was the neatest thing in the world. And from the time the press was invented, what, 1440? Is that what we're all agreeing upon now? Something like that, yeah. Right. More than many, many, many other inventions. A, it stayed fundamentally very similar. Mm -hmm. But B, the impact that our industry has 
should not be underestimated or undervalued. When you think about commercial printing, everybody thinks about Santa Claus from one of Norman Rockwell's illustrations. Yep. Just think that's a cool thing to be part of. And it's one of those things that I always say, the printing industry is the best kept secret out there. I agree. Because people take what is printed for granted. They might see billboards, they see labels, they see books and magazines, and they just always existed. They've always been there. Mm -hmm. They've always existed. And people don't understand the levels of work that goes into them. Mm -hmm. When you're able to be part of something that you create, that you manufacture, that you can watch it go from step A all the way to step B uh, till the end process. If you've ever seen a finishing press where it's folding, binding, and then die cutting all in one conveyor belt. Mm -hmm. Oh, how fun is that? It's a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. Yeah. I still am mesmerized just watching things print, especially Mm -hmm. in the wide format as the head goes back and forth and these beautiful pictures come out on the other side. And it's amazing to see the creativity and what can be designed and developed and created. Okay. So I'm totally showing my age here, but do you remember color keys? I do. Okay. I remember seeing one of those and just being fascinated how it could put all those colors together and make... I just, that's, I miss that part about digital printing because you mm-hmm. don't see how wondrously it is when it's creating it anymore. Yeah. But no, I, same as you. Oh, I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Although I do have to say, I'm glad that I don't have to hand set type. That oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever do that? I did it in junior high. I actually had a tech class and that was one of the things we did. We <sighs> had a one color press and I had to set type by hand. So I learned, I learned how to read backwards. Oh my gosh. And one of my first jobs I had, we had ran an old, old Mark Andy two color press and they'd run two passes through to do CMYK. So obviously you've seen a lot through the years. Seen a lot of print. And as you know, as you probably realized when you stepped into that press at the Seattle Times, Seattle Times, right? A lot of men working the presses. All All around. All men at the time. How did you manage to overcome any of those issues that you might have had now being a woman entering what is kind of the man's world? I think there's two takeaways for me. One, when I started, not only were women not in the press room, I was told point blank to my face, you can't go back there. You're a distraction. You can't go back there. You're not strong enough. I was hired to be a printer in one of my first jobs. Mm -hmm. And within, I walked into work and he goes, oh, no, you're going to work customer service. No, I don't want to work customer service. That's not what you hired me to do. And I was wearing a white blouse. I just remember it very vividly. It was my first day at work. It's the 80s. I'm wearing a white blouse. And he said, fine, go clean a press. You gave me no instructions. You gave me no feedback. And I'm sitting there in a nice, pristine, well-ironed white shirt, which was never the same, right? Of course. And I muddled through it for that first week. That guy was hard, okay? He was not cutting me any slack. And I just kept muddling through it. I remember calling one of my uncles to ask for how do you remove the roller so I could clean it after work that night. And I just kept muddling through it. I just kept doing it. I have a bit of a mouth on me. (laughs) I have never been afraid to say something to somebody, though I regret how I handled situations. In my 20s, I was very quick to make suggestions, to put my thoughts in the question mark. Gosh, maybe if we try it this way. Mm -hmm. Mm. I regret handling it that way, but I didn't have the confidence or the knowledge. When I was in my 30s, I was going through divorce. I had three kids. I'm supporting myself. I don't have time for this. If you don't want to let me in on your playing field, that's fine. I'll beat you on mine. Was very, I'm very, boy, I got kind of defensive about it. Mm -hmm. What I find is the stronger you become in your skill set, the more valuable you are to your employer. Frankly, in my case, those things started to diminish quite a bit. I don't have a lot of instances in my life now where that type of thing happens. When it did, the most effective tool for me was really to be very honest and very direct. This is how you want to talk to me. Is this how you would like people to talk to your daughters when they work? 
I've said that line has been relatively effective for me. Is this how you would like people to treat your wife when they're at work? My biggest frustration as a woman in the print field is how many times my contributions have been utilized, but my efforts minimized. How many times I've been told repeatedly that prefer, and part of it is my niche, right? I'm a very good production manager. I'm a good problem solver. I like print. I like figuring out how things work. And so money tends to follow that. But I've been told that I'm not considered for promotion one, because you're too good in this small niche. But two, because I haven't worked in a lot of print shops where there's been any women in management. Mm -hmm. The first shop I ever worked in that had a woman in upper management was Time Warner. And I'd been printing for 10 years by that point. There was a lovely woman named Anne who ran the entire scheduling department. And she owned that. She owned that entire press room. She was amazing. But I was 31 before I saw a woman in upper management. Now for you, did not having a woman in your early years in those leadership roles change the way you viewed maybe your path or your career trajectory? Yeah. Yes, it did. I remember being very amazed when I saw Anne. I didn't think you could really get that high. Mm -hmm. I loved my job. It wasn't my work. And at that time I was at Time Warner. I was doing special projects. I had a killer job, but I was going to sit in this little back room for a long time doing my killer job. And I kind of accepted that. I was lucky that I was pleased that I wasn't working in customer service. I was pleased I wasn't part of the HR team. Because that's the more traditional women. That's where you see the women in our shops. Um, Seeing Anne lit a really big fire under me. I worked with her for about four months and she took me out to dinner one night. She said, you're aggressive. You're good. You're hungry. And I said, how do I get from here to the next step up? And she said, what do you want? And I said, I want to do special projects. I want to do the things that are really a pain in the butt that nobody likes that they keep coming back to me, but I don't want blah, blah, blah. She spent a couple, two, three weeks working with me. It wasn't about her. She had strong feelings at that time in the 80s about how you had to present yourself professionally. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say she didn't necessarily abdicate for me publicly. She did abdicate with me. She gave me a lot of tips for presenting where my value was. She gave me a lot of information that helped me learn how to define what my value was to my company. After talking to Anne, I had been given at least enough information and resources to say, wow, I've been handling this size of a book. My error rate's the smallest in the shop. My sales have grown 18% for the last three years. Anne was the first manager who took my accomplishments and helped me reward them in a way that it would give me the next step up. I had a lot of male bosses that were supportive. I don't want to say that it wasn't them too, but Anne gave me tools that helped me get up a level. That helped you present yourself in a certain way that would be recognized, that couldn't be dismissed either. Yes. Yes. Beautifully stated. Because that's, I think in some cases, that's what it ends up being. Like you said, you, you're doing these great things, but not that you're looking for the credit, but you would like to be acknowledged for the work that you're doing and what you're being put into it and the skills that you have. I always think that getting my job done is more important than having somebody high five me for doing it. Mm -hmm. But I also think that because I work in a male dominated field that Mm -hmm. if I keep sticking up my hand going, Hey, wait, Hey, 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 I said that at that time, I felt that I got pushed back a little bit on it. I think that I have a very common issue with many direct women where I've had management say, Oh, you are aggressive. Like that's a bad word. You're shrill. I love that one. Shrill, right? It's easy in meeting situations to go to how the person's presenting as opposed to listening to the message. And I think that sometimes as women being talked to about how we communicate is what is another tool that you use not to listen to our message. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. You mentioned that someone classified you as being aggressive. Mm -hmm. If it was a man, he would have been been a go-getter. He would have been on top of it. He makes things happen. Mm -hmm. It's just so interesting to see how 
especially early on, it has changed over the years, I think, mm -hmm. and it has gotten better. But just how that bias worked its way into and those stereotypes worked their way into. Mm -hmm. If you were confident and spoke your mind, you're aggressive. There might be other words that they might use for it mm -hmm. that are demeaning. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh, yeah. Then the question is, how have you seen it change over the years for women in printing? Has it gotten easier? Has it gotten better? Is it a mix of the two that it's okay? Those are really good questions. And I don't think there's one answer mm -hmm. for them. Overwhelming, just like almost every other industry, we are seeing more women. Yes. Okay. Printing, we need more women. It is well documented that all those guys go colorblind far faster than we do. We need ladies in the press room. In terms of more women in the press room, there's more in there because there's more women everywhere. But I still see the bulk of us in the accepted areas, HR, accounting, customer service, sales. Sales you see a lot more women in. And I think we're frankly, in some cases better. I think we're really, really well suited to it. I think we listen. I have yet to meet a woman who cannot multi-manage. I have yet to meet a woman who is not used to hearing three separate conversations and integrating them and then putting them into something else. I'm not looking on a Time Warner scale where I want to hold managed Nestle's printing, right? Where it's now a group of salespeople all in a suite, all dealing with upper management, and they're no longer talking about the jobs anymore. They're talking about how they're going to make money and we're going to drop your substrate a little bit. We're going to run all this work through one shop. Maybe we're going to give you a kickback if you buy $150,000 worth of printing. I'm not in that world. I don't see that. I know it's there. I don't think there's very many women in that group. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be the direction that my industry really is leaning towards. So that troubles me. When I look at tiny shops, when I look at shops like mine, when I look at shops that have 30 employees, I see women better distributed throughout. So it's gotten better, at least a little bit in certain areas. I think it's gotten better in a lot of areas, but I think you could walk through many print shops and you would be hard pressed to see a woman at, I'm trying to think of a shop I know that has Brooks and Whittle has a couple women on their board. They're not connected with printing at this point anymore. They're even the ones I'm trying to think the one, the one woman that's coming to my mind, she has nothing to do with print anymore. She has to do with office integration management in terms of what I don't really know what you're doing anymore, but you're not working print. I don't know. Still, I don't know a single girly press is probably the only shop I know that is pure women. It's owned by a couple lovely, lovely women on Capitol Hill, and they make a huge point of hiring women. And that's what they do. And you go in there and there's six ladies running the press. There's three ladies manning the phones and doing the customer service. That is the only shop in my entire life that I've seen like that. I would have there's to agree. A couple, like, yeah. A shop that print for pay shop. Yes. I believe there may be one or two implants that are all women. That would make sense. I think there's a lot more opportunities for women. For Time Warner, which at the time was an internal shop, mm -hmm. there was far more opportunities based upon your work than your gender. They're just structured very differently because in many mm -hmm. cases, also a lot of the implants, they're working for governments or healthcare or right. other. They also have a certain diversity yes. guideline that they need to have. Yes. And that comes a, down from corporate. We have to be open to diverse people, to disabilities, to women. You're right. The in-shops, I think, are like that. The government opportunities have more women in them. Mm -hmm. And they don't have as much of the question of is how can we get more diverse voices? They have them because they're already hiring them as part of that process. So then the question is for those that don't have that ingrained because of a, a corporate mandate, how can we get more women, more diverse voices within the print industry? Well, printing is suffering anyways, because it's just not a trade that people think about. Nobody mm -hmm. ever realizes how many jobs there are in this field and how big it is, which is a red flag for us anyways, right? Yeah. I think it's a shame we don't have the same level of trade schools, of recognizing that not everyone's going to do a four-year university degree 
or six year, people do not realize that you can have a fine career. You can support your kids. You can have a cat. You can have a great work-life balance. I don't think perhaps we've communicated that effectively. We certainly are one of those glamorous fields, right? That you dream of doing in junior high. We, in terms of getting more women there, I think that is a printing company, the thing that's helped us because when we started, there was three of us. Now we're five and a half. So we're very excited by our growth. We really do push though, the soft value work. You're measurable. You're running a press. You're measurable. If you're meeting and not messing up my schedules, do I care if you come in at 6 a.m. or at 10 a.m.? If you're working it out on your own with the team, I'm not going to babysit you because Mm -hmm. I hire good people and I trust them to do good work. We have very flexible hours. We pay well. We pay well above industry standard. We want you to be fiercely loyal on our shop. We want you to have a sense of ownership. We want you to stop the press if it's not right. Our two pressmen have both commented that that energy is so different and foreign from what they left. One of our pressmen had his family had a health issue. And for two and a half weeks, he was, we weren't telling him to do it. We were all picking up the slack, but he kept coming in at the oddest hours to do his work. Afterwards, we were like, you know, stop, stop, go stay home with your family. Take care of what you need to take care of. But he did. He took care of exactly what had to be taken care of. And I don't think I would have a team member that did that if we didn't take care of him. Mm -hmm. So for women, I think we value, I know I value, I value freedom. I value autonomy. I value not being micromanaged. I value being respected. Those words are probably in the first two paragraphs every time we put a job posting up. And I think that helps a lot. It does help, but then you need to get, those people to come in so that way you can be in front of them. Yes. Talk to them. Yes. Yes. But I think that's a lot harder on a big picture company when they're using algorithms, when they're going through headhunters, where they're looking only for certain buzzwords and that's, or my industry doesn't have it so much, but they used to internships. You used to work for two, four weeks for free in printing, and then you'd get hired on. Mm-hmm. A bigger company doesn't make time and doesn't put an algorithm or a buzzword for somebody who doesn't fit a very, very small niche. It's not about having a seat at the table. It's about knowing where the restaurant is. Yeah. Right. Very much so. Mm -hmm. So looking ahead, what aspirations do you have for the future of the print industry? What would you love to see it become? Oh, okay. Well, uninformed Stacy with no ability to make any of this happen. Okay. Yeah. I think that digital printing has a tremendous amount of potential. I think we're using it. I do not think it is all things to all projects. I do a lot of larger, larger runs. I still run some flexo projects. I think that that whole part of the market has been totally forgotten and Mm -hmm. there's a lot of value in it. I am saddened by what I, I guess I'd call it the shrinkflation of our industry. Bigger shops are going down a level in substrates, but we're not being really transparent about that. Bigger shops move a lot of work to what makes sense to them as opposed to the end consumer. We're not honest or transparent about that. I'd like to see more weight and acknowledgement given to some traditional methods of printing that are beautiful. I see a huge market for very niche high-end printing. There is a niche for traditional high-end foil stamping and embossing. And you can be doing that on a workhorse press that's 45 years old. I wish in a perfect world that we would have fewer large companies and more small businesses. Mm -hmm. But I wish that for society as a whole. We used to live in a world where you could support yourself working in a grocery store and raise a family. And that was only 50 years ago. We live in an industry where people work two part-time jobs because they don't have benefits. We work a lot in our industry to satisfy shareholders as opposed to our end client. And if I had a magic wand in the print world, that would be the area that I find troubling. You should be doing what takes care of the client. If you do the client first, I think you'll do well. And also with smaller businesses, then you really are doing business with the people. 
I do miss the people. Not the company. No. Not the business. Yeah, you. I know my customers. My cat's named after my favorite customer's son who was born the same day as my cat. <laughs> That's a true story. My cat's name is Wesley. Hi. Hi, Kristen. Hi, Wesley. So, <laughs> and she, you know, we've been working together for years. She had a baby. She said, I named him Wesley. I was like, oh my God, my cat just had a baby. I'm going to name mine Wesley too. Why not? I send, her, I send her pictures of my silly cat. She sends me pictures of her beautiful little boy. It's a fair trade. I think it is. Mm-hmm. But I am so grateful. I like my job. I love my job. I like my customers. If you call and you talk to me and you really in a bind, I probably can fix it instantly. When I worked for a larger company with a bigger chain of command, by the time the salesperson, who at this point is only selling, they have no really input, feedback, interest in what your job ran. I love that part. That's the part I love the most. The money or the sales, they follow the fact that I love this process so much. As an industry, we've kind of lost the people who appreciated the process. Mm-hmm. they're still around but they are they're, we're, we're, yeah but they don't make as much noise as they used to no and we we're getting bought up at alarming rates mm-hmm. so. we both see the same news headlines with yeah m a's and every yeah. single week in your magazine every single month so-and-so is acquired so-and-so but we never go back to that company after it's been acquired three years later and say are you still really floating are you just a sham site mm-hmm your business being funneled to the bigger guy how many of the crew that were there when you got acquired still work there so i don't think i have any power or influence in changing any of that and i don't think it's going to change but would i like it to yeah yes you would i would so wrapping up my favorite question that i'm asking everyone is knowing what you know now so your experience from when you first saw those presses back when you were a kid, through everything that you've been through in your career, what advice would you give yourself if you were just starting in printing today? Not all people want a job that they love. Not all people want to be fully invested. A lot of people want to go to work and not be in love with it. I'm in love with what I do, so it makes my job a lot more fun. So if you came to me and you said, I want to go into printing, or if I looked at me again, I knew I wanted to be a printer because I liked it, because it made me happy, because I thought I could make some aspects of it better. I was all in. So if I was giving me advice again, starting all over, I'd say, are you all all in? What do you see your first year being? I would have put more thought into it. Where are you going to be in five years? But I've been glad that I didn't get distracted and going into a parallel management path as opposed to a hands-on path, because this is what brings me joy. Mm -hmm. I think that talking to anybody looking at launching their career, whether it's in print or anything else, my first question is, are you all in? Who's managing the skill sets that you don't know and how are you going to learn them? Honestly, probably a plan B. I'm a big plan B person. <laughs> if, B, if, C, D, whatever it's works. E, F. I'm on plan like M now, right? <laughs> if you love printing and it goes through these changes, what are you going to do when the change happens that you don't know? How curious are you? How much do you buy into staying learning mm-hmm. to, to wanting to see different opportunities? If you're not curious, I don't think printing is a strong field for you. You've got to be open to change in our in our area now. And printing changes a lot. So fast. Can I ask you that same question? What would you sure. have told yourself if you were starting all over again with your love of newspapers? Something that has not turned back on me. So I'm thinking. Be more confident. Don't second yes. guess. As much as you, as I had in the past, Mm -hmm. be willing to take a stand where it matters. Yes. But have fun. This is a fun industry though. Mm -hmm. That's probably some of the advice I would have given myself if I'm starting. The path was relatively Mm -hmm. straight, but could there have been improvements? Yeah, they could have been. Right. 
Do I have regrets? No, I don't. Because regrets are learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. We are who we are because of where we dropped the ball before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, Stacy, this is an amazing conversation. I very much enjoyed spending time with you, Denise. So thank you again for the time this afternoon. I do appreciate it. Hopefully we'll be able to have another chat in another time. Take care. Thank you.